I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One would have to be blind to the fact that Jesus Christ is returning very soon. Satan has blinded so many people to this fact as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus told us that when we see a convergence of signs that his return was near as we read in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. What things are we to be watching for? And are we seeing any evidence of these things pointing to Jesus' return today? Jesus declared what these things are that we are to be watching for in Matthew 24, 3-14. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21:11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Good evening, and we have made it through another week together here, another trying week in this country for so many, for the families who have lost loved ones battling this virus, who are still battling the virus, and for the families across this country struggling to make ends meet, to put food on the table, the workers who want to get back to work. All of it a real test, and all of it leading to growing protests over how to do this and the timing. Some of those protests very heated, some demonstrators armed, and the president tonight defending some of those protesters. The death toll growing in the U.S., more than 64,000 lives lost, nearly 10,000 more just since Monday. 18 states tonight still seeing the number of cases rise. Here in New York, the last patients leaving the Javits Center, but the beds and equipment will stay there as a precaution with authorities bracing for a second wave this fall and schools now closed in New York for the rest of the year. The Massachusetts governor tonight ordering people to wear face coverings in public after the state saw its highest one-day death toll this week. And the images from Texas tonight, restaurants and stores are opening up even as that state reported its highest death toll yet. These are the difficult decisions playing out in so many states. And late today, more protests. This one right here in Huntington Beach, California, people frustrated with life on hold. And all of this is late today. The FDA fast-tracked its approval of remdesivir, the first treatment to show promise. It's sometimes hard to understand why our loving and merciful God would display such anger and wrath toward his people. But remember this, God's punishments always have the goal of repentance and restoration. Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In these verses of scripture, we see God using disaster to draw his people to himself, to bring about repentance and the desire to come to him 
as children to their Heavenly Father. The spread of viruses, such as Ebola and the coronavirus, are just a foretaste of pandemics that will be part of the end times. For those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, disease should be a reminder that life on this earth is fragile and can be lost at any moment. As bad as pandemics are, hell will be far worse. The Christian, however, has the assurance of salvation and the hope of eternity because of the blood of Christ shed on the cross for us, as we read in Isaiah 53:5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Despite protest by hundreds of Michiganders at the state capitol Thursday and efforts by the Republican-controlled House and Senate to stop her, Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed three new executive orders Thursday, extending the state's emergency and disaster declarations through the end of May, saying scientific data shows the state isn't out of the woods yet. can't put a hard and fast timeline because a lot of this depends on human behavior and our ability to observe these best practices. Some residents see it as government overreach and a power grab. I've had enough of being told what I can and cannot do. I've had enough of worrying about bills and making money. No one, no, especially a politician, has the right to devalue an individual by labeling them non-essential. There were tense moments. State Senator Dana Paul Hankey tweeting, directly above me, men with rifles yelling at us. Some of my colleagues who own bulletproof vests are wearing them. Michigan has been hit hard, registering more than 40,000 cases, suffering nearly 3,700 deaths. But not everyone buys the numbers. I do think that, that we have a virus, but I do think that the numbers are inflated. I think it's all political. Republicans who control the legislature think the governor is overstepping her authority. At this point in the COVID crisis, what can the governor accomplish alone that she can't do together with the leadership of the House and the Senate? The State House passed a resolution authorizing the House Speaker to seek legal action against the governor for her conduct during the pandemic. She's facing a number of lawsuits, including one by five businesses, arguing her pandemic-related executive orders have shuttered civil society, placed 10 million people under under house arrest and taking jobs away from nearly 1.2 million people, all without due process of law. My husband's an electrician and he cannot go back to work supposedly until May 7th as long as that goes through, but he can go out on a golf course as of today. I don't think it's fair to start making those provisions. It is very important that we as Americans stand up for our, for our Constitution and for our civil liberties, because as we know, government continues to take and take. Governor Whitmer says she hopes to reopen certain sectors of the economy in the days ahead. But for now, she faces a political battle over government power. You may have seen this tape already. If not, you've likely seen many more like it in the past few weeks. Two armed officers arrive at a family's home in Wisconsin. Someone has reported the mother to police for arranging a play date for her daughter. That's now a crime. Here's what happened next. Are you aware that we're in a stay-at-home order right now? Uh, yeah, obviously. By the government? Yes, I Wisconsin? am aware. Okay, you're aware of that? I am aware. So I don't need to explain that to you? Why are you here? Because your daughter is going to play at other people's home and you're allowing it to happen. Stop having your kid go by other people's home. Are we done here? No, we're not. Okay. Your middle initial and your last name. I'm not giving it to you. I haven't done anything wrong. Okay, I perfect. Got it. We got it. Yeah, okay. Good. And that'll be documented too, that you're uncooperative. You are uncooperative. That will be documented. Notice the tone they strike with this mother. They are standing on her property, uninvited, hectoring her about the so-called crime of allowing her daughter to play outside the house. They're not apologizing for this. They're not embarrassed to be carrying out an order that has no basis in science. They are utterly self-confident. They treat her with pure contempt like a peasant. And later, the Calumet County Sheriff's Department posted an account of what happened on their Facebook page. In it, they refer to that mother's mobile home six times. Just, you know, she lives in a mobile home. Oh, just a prol, just a peasant. Shut up and obey. Who cares what she thinks? They believe they have the right to do that. The question is, where exactly do they get that right? That's a good question. It's a question that we are strongly discouraged from asking. 
The short answer is governors told them they could. These are the images that have now been seen across the country. Angry protesters, some of them armed, spilling into the Capitol in Michigan, demanding the country reopen. Today, President Trump tweeting his support for demonstrators, saying the governor of Michigan should give a little and put out the fire. These are very good people, but they are angry. They want their lives back again safely. Today, the governor saying she understands people are feeling restless and want to get back to work, but says she found some of the images she saw disturbing. A flashpoint in this debate over how and when to reopen the country, from Chicago to Indianapolis to California. Now take our freedom. In Huntington Beach, hundreds of protesters swarming the coast, officers managing crowds on horseback, just 24 hours after California's governor ordered the closure of all beaches in Orange County. Never in American history have politicians been more powerful than they are now. Effectively, they are gods. In the state of Maine, for example, Governor Janet Mills now has the power to suspend any law she doesn't like. She can seize any state resource she feels like seizing. She can force any citizen or all citizens from their home. She can do all of this for as long as she wants, as long as she believes Maine is in a state of emergency. In fact, there's virtually nothing that Janet Mills can't now do. Many governors now have these powers. J.B. Pritzker is the governor of Illinois. On Monday, Pritzker did his best to explain why his word is now law in the state. It has to be law, he explained. Otherwise, thousands would die. The stay-at-home order has prevented tens of thousands of illnesses and thousands of deaths. History will remember those who put politics aside to come together to keep people safe. It will also remember those who so blindly devoted to ideology and the pursuit of personal celebrity that they made an enemy of science and of reason. In three sentences, Governor Pritzker framed himself as a leader of historic statue. Those who doubt his decrees are, quote, enemies of science and reason, enemies of civilization itself, enemies of the state. Two days later, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, it emerged that Pritzker's own wife, who has her own state employees, was one of these people. His wife apparently had violated the lockdown herself. Governor Pritzker was asked about this. Here's how he responded. What is your response to people who say the stay-at-home order and non-essential travel bans aren't being abided by your family? I believe there's a report from Illinois Rising Action that says that she recently traveled to Florida. Well, first of all, I want to say that in politics, it used to be that we kept our families out of it. You know, my official duties have nothing to do with my family. So I'm just not going to answer that question. It's inappropriate. And I find it reprehensible, honestly, that that uh, that reporter wrote a story about it. Yeah. How dare someone cover that? Asking about whether or not J.B. Pritzker's own family is obeying the order that your family is morally obligated to follow is, quote, inappropriate. Indeed, the governor says it is reprehensible. How dare you? Nationwide, at least 36 states now easing some restrictions by the end of next week. But cases of the virus still rising in at least 18 states. In Texas today, restaurants filling up with customers in Houston and shopping malls opening two at 25 percent capacity just a day after the state saw its deadliest day. In Oklahoma, crowds flocking to malls, some people not wearing face masks. But tonight, a lockdown in Gallup, New Mexico, after a spike in cases, one of the highest infection rates in the country. This motel converted into a respiratory clinic to treat COVID patients. In Michigan, a warning from a doctor on the front lines. In rural parts of this country, there is no way that we are near a peak. The fact that people think because numbers are low that are reported that we are in the clear, that it's not coming, that is absolutely ridiculous. As New York State descends from its peak, still around 1,000 new cases per day. It's a lot better than where we were, for sure. But 1,000 new cases every day is still a very high infection rate. It's still a burden on the hospital system. MSNBC recently set a camera crew to document one of the latest and most Orwellian developments in America's descent into Chinese-style social control, barking drones that harangue citizens from the air. MSNBC was delighted by it. Please 
go away from each other and separate. Elizabeth, New Jersey is now using drones to spread the life-saving message. You are not immune to this virus. Move away from each other, commands the state of New Jersey. Break it up. Your God-given right to free assembly has been suspended indefinitely. Back inside, proles, or you will face the consequences. MSNBC applauds this as if it's all completely normal. In fact, it is, they tell us, a life-saving message. Tonight, the FDA fast-tracking the first potential treatment against coronavirus for emergency use. Remdesivir, after early trial results, showed it could cut the disease's course from 15 to 11 days. Tonight, that wet market in Wuhan back in the spotlight as the head of the European Union joins calls for a probe into the origin of the virus. Just yesterday, President Trump suggested he's seen evidence to support a theory being pushed by some conservative outlets that the virus originated in a lab in Wuhan. Today, Trump responding to questions about those claims. We'll be talking to you about it at a later date when we really know some good hard facts. Right. But I've seen probably every version of most of the things you've heard and some of the things you haven't heard. Yesterday, the U.S. intelligence community acknowledging it's investigating whether the virus was the result of an accident at a lab in Wuhan, but agreeing with scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified. There's also that new report this evening warning that Americans, that the U.S. should be prepared to deal with this pandemic for up to two years. That obviously got our attention. It's just one study, but it does urge caution and says, in essence, Americans should be ready for a possible second wave and other spikes along the way. And David, those researchers say that the spikes could be even worse in the future than what we're experiencing right now. The other day, prosecutors in New Jersey charged nine people for daring to participate in a Jewish wedding in their backyard. A few months ago, that would have made the news. For 250 years, Americans have enjoyed the unfettered right to practice their faith as they choose. Now they don't. It happened overnight. Last month, Christians across the country were legally prohibited from celebrating Easter in their own churches. The national media barely noted it. How exactly is this happening? Well, it turns out that's not clear. Strangely, not very many people have asked. Politicians have no right to do any of this. They cannot make it illegal for people to go to religious services. The Constitution of the United States expressly prohibits that. The words could not be clearer. The First Amendment explicitly prevents government from making any law that inhibits the exercise of religious faith. That's not a detail or a footnote. It is a cornerstone of our history and of our legal system. Occasionally, you hear someone complain about this. Some lonely civil libertarian will fret that we may be on a slippery slope toward losing our rights. If only. We're already there. We've slid to the bottom of that slope. Our rights are gone. No one has explained how politicians are allowed to do this. Where's the authority come from? How can they override the Constitution? Nobody seems to care. They're too afraid. But if you think this moment is scary, consider what might come next. Now that we've ceded all authority in the country to our political leaders, what can't they do? What are the limits to their power? That's not a theoretical question. It's not an argument over philosophy or political theory. It is the most practical possible question. The answer will define where this country goes next. What can't politicians do in the name of public health? As it stands, politicians won't let people worship or work or go to school or see their aging parents. They place the nation under house arrest. That's happening today, right now. But let's say we all get more afraid. What then? What couldn't they start doing? Could they intern people? Seriously, you can dismiss the possibility of that if you like, but remember that just a few months ago, most of us would have dismissed as ludicrous the possibility that propaganda spewing drones would be hovering above. Now we have them. So what's next? What can't they do? Let's draw a line at some point. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, 
and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering, and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken, and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 7.4 billion, meaning 1.85 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 3.75 billion. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. 
He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.